and welcome to today's trainer education webcast, You Can Teach Anyone to Innovate, with co-author Ron Roberts, hosted by HRDQ. Before we begin, please note there is a question and answer button located at the top right-hand corner of your screen. During our presentation, please feel free to submit questions using that button. We will either answer your questions as they come in, during our Q&A session at the end of our presentation, or after the session by email. Our webcast today will last around 55 minutes, including a brief Q&A session based on your submissions. You will receive an exclusive discount offer today as well. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's presentation. I am in business development for HRDQ. HRDQ is a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Please welcome the presenter of today's webcast, Mr. Ron Roberts. Ron is an expert in the field of accelerated experiential learning, as well as an accomplished consultant, trainer, and author. He has created more than 70 training games and holds six patents on learning technology. Ron has a master's degree in counseling psychology, is the president of both Action Center Training and of ACT Games. He is also a professor in the management and communication departments at Penn State University. He is here today to share with us his expertise. Thank you for joining us today, Ron. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Now, on a humorous note, Sarah left out my most important title, which is full-blown creative genius, a title which I've taken on personally. However, my wife continues to call me Mr. Humility for some reason. But let's get started by learning a little more about the audience. Um, we'd like to ask you a question here. When you hear the term innovation, what word first comes to mind? Your option. Oh, excuse me. Um, your options are cutting edge, technology, creativity, forward thinking, or soul innovator. We have the wrong. Here it is. When you hear the term innovation, what word comes to mind? Cutting edge, technology, creativity, forward thinking, or a sole provider? Go ahead and answer. We are slightly limited by our technology, so we've come up with a few fill-in answers for you. Take a minute and choose the one that comes closest to your initial thoughts. And we'll give you a few seconds. Thank you. We're going to review the answers shortly also. Set up. OK. Um, I would like to uh, first discuss why innovation is so important. Innovation is the lifeblood of all successful modern organizations. It is a process by which organizations do many things. They do more with less. They increase productivity. They meet long-term and short-term goals. They improve existing products, services, and processes. They create spin-offs and extensions of previous successes. They maximize efficiencies, stay competitive in a diverse global market, and manage complex systems within the organization. Without innovation, Organizations may survive, but they seldom thrive. Innovation is most important. Let's ask our audience one more question to understand where you're at a little bit. I'm sorry, Ron. We are going to have to skip that piece. Um, but if you want to move on, we'll go ahead and reveal for our first poll. OK. So let's see the results of our first poll. Sorry about that. So, wow, 51% said creativity, 35% said forward thinking, 11% said cutting edge, and 1% tied on technology and a sole innovator. So, uh, let's see where we're at here. Uh, all these terms describe innovation but each person has a different perception and meaning of, of innovation. Being in agreement on what innovation 
means is part of organizational alignment. And alignment is required to maintain and sustain innovation. It is often the case that innovation is confused with creativity. So let's review the definition of both next. In its simplest definition, innovation is a process by which change is implemented, whereas creativity is an act of coming up with something new. Both include the act of coming up with something new, a product, a service, a concept, an application, or a process, but innovation is a step beyond creativity. To be considered innovative, the something new needs to be integrated into society. When it becomes integrated in a way that allows high, constant, and sustainable demand for that product, service, or process, then innovation has taken place, only then. Creativity, therefore, is a subset of innovation. Think of the post-it note. I'm sure all of you have heard of that. Many would probably say this product is not all creative, as they tend to view creativity as more a form of art. But creativity applies to all new ideas, even if they are perceived as possibly being boring. But what makes the post-it note so innovative? Many of you may not know, but in 1968, Dr. Spencer Silver, along with Jesse Kopps, both scientists at 3M, accidentally developed a low-tack, reusable, pressure-sensitive adhesive. For five years, they tried to promote this invention, but nobody liked it. There was no buy-in from any others at 3M. Finally, in 1974, a colleague of theirs, Art Fry, who attended one of Silver's presentations, came up with the idea of using these adhes adhesives to anchor his bookmarks and, of all things, his hymnal because he had so many papers in there that kept falling out. He thought, I bet a lot of other people have problems marking their books as well. By using the innovation in a new context, which is the key to innovation, creatively applying it to another application, the post-it became a bestseller. So now that we understand what innovation is, let's look at some examples. One of my favorite examples is from as seen on TV. I love all these products. They are perfect examples how everyday people are always coming up with solutions for everyday problems. In front of us we have Petty Paws, the Snuggie, Benderoos, the Grill Daddy Pro, the Rocket Fishing Rod 2. I guess they had improvements on number one. Tool Bandit, which seems really cool to me, and Hanger Cascade. Now, I've had Hanger Cascade, and that works really well. And I bought Petty Paws, but the electric nail file, uh, it's an electric nail file for your pets. And it was not a favorite of my dog, as she kept running away, as she could hear the buzzing noise of the grinder. So I had to chase her around. When I finally got it, I couldn't do it. I had to send it back but it gives you a sample of why products are so sensitive and how many different things are required in innovation and why we're going to review the seven-step process. Um, some other examples of innovative products are usually the first to come to mind, but what about business examples? There's mergers. Mergers are also examples of innovative business practices business partnering together to implement new products, services, or day-to-day -day functionality are also innovative. An example is TD Bank had a lot of capital, and they bought Commerce Bank, who was in fact having serious internal issues. They did this in order to expand their presence into the United States, and this has been a very successful partnership. One of my professors at Penn State told me about another one, Xi'an, a PVC manufacturer, merged with M.A. Hanna, a specialty mining chemicals company, in order to cut out the middleman. Xi'an now has a direct, low-cost opportunity to buy raw plastic materials, and M.A. Hanna obtained an access to a large marketing outlet. Some other innovations are out of necessity. Morgan Stanley and Smith Barney, or Wells Fargo and Wachovia, were initiated as part of a government mandate. Organizations implement innovative services that can be customer-based or of internal nature only. An example of a customer-based innovation 
might be CVS Pharmacy's addition of Minute Clinic, which provides certified practitioners, treatments, health screenings, and vaccinations at a walk-up pharmacy. And of course, as a well-known enterprise rent-a-car solved a problem of dropping and picking off rental vehicles years ago, providing pickup services for standard, stranded customers who needed a car. Another area, internal innovations, are usually not noticed by the public or their customers, but are just as important. One example uh, is what we are all doing right now, virtual internet-driven meetings. Global organizations are using a wide variety of providers to stay collaborative but reduce travel. Uh, manufacturing processes uh, and initiatives like the assembly line or Six Sigma and Lean management techniques pro prevent bottlenecks and constraints. In the book The Goal, the author Goldratt talks about how a consultant spent months trying to help a manufacturing company gain control of their costs. It was only when he discovered that a few small bottlenecks were causing the entire system to be out of balance that the company started to be profitable. And I have to tell you another great, brilliant example of innovation that I saw just the other day on TV. Um, most of the billboards out there in use now are digital in nature and can be changed in an instant through programming done at a central location. So the FBI of all organizations is now using these digital bill billboards to capture criminals. The minute there is a crime reported and they have a likely suspect, they post criminal pictures with a phone number to call right in the area where the crime took place. And they've had incredible results with very high rate of capturing those who break the law. What a brilliant method of using an existing technology in a new, innovative, out-of-context way. Now, innovation is happening in businesses every day. But where and with whom does it happen? The answer, everywhere. Anyone can innovate. All of you can innovate. All of you can train people to be innovators. And everyone at all levels must contribute to create and sustain a culture of innovation. New ideas are constantly flowing inside of organizations at all levels, from bottom to top, top to bottom, and across every layer. The most thriving organizations have created processes for capturing these new ideas and implementing them. Outside consultants and new employees are a common way for organizations to jumpstart innovative processes. With their fresh eyes and focused goals, they can contribute at a different level. Now, this is an interesting fact that I've discovered from my years of work with corporate CEOs. The average CEO has only 12 to 18 months to make an innovative change, because after that, they become assimilated into the old culture and struggle to make new breakthroughs. But organizations that tap into every employee's thoughts for fresh ideas will reap the benefits. Here's a very interesting story, an example of innovation. A high-end national restaurant chain with about 2,500 stores was seeing huge excessive breakage in their expensive China, costing the company nearly a half million dollars annually. The CEO was on a mission to find the cause. After a number of meetings with high-level management at both corporate and store locations, they still could not uncover the issue. Finally, at dinner one evening at one of his own restaurants, he asked the waiter if he knew what the cause was. The waiter said, you know, I don't know, but I can take you back to somebody who does know. And he took him back to the person in charge of washing the dishes, who in fact knew the answer. It turned out that their large commercial dishwashers had a serious flaw. It vibrated harshly during certain cycles and was cracking the dishes. They fixed all 10,000 dishwashers at 2,500 restaurants, saving the company $500,000. And wait to hear this. Both the waiter and the dishwasher received $50,000 bonuses. And the company instituted a new policy awarding employees bonuses of 10% on any savings that arose from their innovative uh, insights. So not only can anyone be innovative, but they can also develop the ability to innovate. And how do we develop that ability? 
challenge your employees to question everything, every product, every service, every process, every meeting, every activity at every level. Open the lines of communication by asking them their thoughts and getting feedback. Provide moments where they can really embrace experimentation by building time into this at each project. Facilitate group sessions that focus on reframing so they explore things out of context. As trainers, engage them experientially in creating new ideas and asking questions. The possibility of practicing innovation increases dramatically. Let's next look at practicing innovation. Practicing innovation in a classroom atmosphere where highly with highly experiential games is a great way to begin a culture that embraces innovation at every level. Almost all participants learn to innovate through trial and error. Some learn through insight, but the majority of people learn through repetition. Junkyard Games fills this bill perfectly. Uh, Junkyard Games is an outrageously fun innovation simulation in which teams compete to create new sporting games for their country. The challenge is that they may only use um, the miscellaneous junk available to them. The parts are random, and not every team is given the same stuff. The country, each country must host uh, other teams playing their games, game creations, and the outrageous fun begins. A colleague of mine, Bernie DeCove, and I created Junkyard Games out of a need to partic for participants to feel the excitement, motivation, success, and innovation. To create a culture of innovation from the ground up, we need to get past the negative attitudes that certain people are not as creative as others or that they have no ideas to contribute. That's rubbish. Everyone has an eye can contribute. We also needed a process of innovation uh, which people could follow, and thus we created the seven-step um, model of innovation. For many years, uh, for many years of experimentation and inventing 70 training games, six that have been patented, and actually a couple that haven't done so well, <laughs> I have culminated and learned a great deal, and I've culminated a seven-step model of innovation that's now published in the Junkyard Games Facilitator Guide. The model of a simplified form is as follows. Start with the end in mind. We're going to go over each of these. Visualize success and conceptualize every aspect of the task necessary to reach it. And brainstorm without limits. The first three are actually the conceptual phase. Then design and produce a rough working model. The next two are part of the feedback and continuation phase. Tinker with it continually. Redesign and remodel until you hit the mark. Strive for full implementation, distribution, and cultural integration of, the, of your innovation. Now, in order to help you apply these uh, seven steps in your work, let's take an in-depth look. I will use Junkyard Games as an example of experiential activity that teaches innovation throughout this part. There are other games out there that will help participants develop their initiative, ta their innovative talents as well. Step one, start with the end in mind. This is the step where you've met the cha a challenge that nothing at hand can counter or correct. You've also asked the question and were unsatisfied with the answer. This is the thinking phase of the model. Innovators recognize in step one what is real, as well as what is needed to envision the ideal situation. What answer to the questions do you want to receive? The real is your current situation, and the idea is your spark of a vision. As you reflect on the current situation, what gaps do you need to fill to reach your goal and reach your ideal? Mental vision that the steps should be out of focus, letting in any vague solution that can help you achieve your goal. Working backwards and inductively frames the basic direction of your innovation. But it should continue to be blurry. Think of it as a child's coloring book. In the first step, you trace over the outer lines of the image. 
The ideal is the end where you begin. Now, some innovator traits. In step one, you start with the end in mind. Innovators are uncomfortable or dissatisfied with the present circumstances. They are curious and open to possibilities, sometimes even with an obsessive nature, which I can attest to. They are intently focused on the issues at hand and solving the problems, picturing the box that they are in and looking for a better place outside of it. Innovators comfortably hold opposites in their head at this point without anxiety. I'm going to repeat that. It's so important. Innovators comfortably hold opposites in their head at this point without anxiety and are able to synthesize these opposites without setting one, settling for one or the other. It's most important in the process of inventing. By scrutinizing common experiences and phenomena, inventors become like social scientists. Inventors are keen observers. Now, this is my favorite part. Let's look at some applications. When uh, playing junkyard games, participants are presented with a challenge, which is only a metaphor for the challenges that every one of us face every day. The first step is to envision the ideal game. How would they come up with a game from out of thin air, from a mere pile of junk? How would they best beat the competition? They roughly formulate how the game will be played in their mind and communicate the ideas within their team. Then they begin to think about possible pieces of the puzzle, starting with an incoherent pile of stuff in front of them and working backwards again to create a fun working game. So from the classroom now into the real world, let's look at some business examples. You may never think of an attorney as innovative, but they are a great example. We actually use our attorney as this example in all seven steps. As an attorney begins to work with a new client, he or she knows what the true story is and is creating an initial brief. They must start with the end in mind. They must begin to think backwards in broad strokes to create a working defense for their client. Another business example is Scott Cook, founder of Intuit, observed his wife struggling with tracking daily expenses. From that, he developed Quicken personal finance software, a brilliant solution. Many times, people do not take the time to explore past this first step, but to be innovative, you must continue with that passion to, for change in order to reach step two. Step two, visualize and conceptualize. Step two in our innovation model is to visualize and conceptualize every aspect of the task necessary to reach the objective. As innovators work backwards with the end in mind, they start to describe the steps to achieve their ideal. At this phase, writing notes, sketching every facet of the process will help to conceptualize the innovation. The brain works in pictures. Remember the coloring book image from our first step? Here you begin to lightly shade in the picture. At this step, anticipate roadblocks and hindrances. They will start to form, and this is okay. Being aware of these roadblocks and hindrances will help you in later steps in the model Dwell and sleep on every element in your innovation. Take time to explore the visuals and begin crafting them into rough conceptual outlines of the innovation. In step two, you are filling in the blanks and the details between the real and the ideal. Innovators' traits. An innovator's passion for change is really tested in this step. And I can attest to that, too. They are visualizing what could be and staying focused on the issues at hand. Innovators have the ability to successfully connect seemingly unrelated concepts from different fields. They connect all the dots. We call this free associating. And many believe this is the foundation of all innovation. And I can tell you it's the most important part, free associating. They remain positive and confident and will find a solution. Here they will face all the reasons why their innovation has never been done before. 
innovators need to dismiss those thoughts and relax, gently relax through these negative moments. Step to application. When playing junkyard games, participants are provided with in innovation and process improvement journals where they are instructed to make sketches, take notes, and record their visions. As a team, they describe their thoughts and share their concepts for creating the best competitive sporting event. The task may seem impossible, but by breaking it down into small pieces conceptually and taking one piece at a time, it is amazing how much the team can accomplish in a short time. Our innovative attorney at this point visualizes and conceptualizes as well. They must come up with the ideas and ways to defend their client, whether guilty or innocent. They need to freely associate many different facets and pieces of information to connect all the dots so the jury sees it clearly. Other examples, when MGM Studios set out to make a movie, they create storyboards and rough drafts for their storyline. When a stage director on Broadway is preparing for rehearsals, they make notes of where the actors will move on the stage if they visualize the scene. Conceptions at this stage aren't final, but they're starting, it's a starting point for the innovator. So after starting with the mind, end in mind to create the visual concept, innovators then need to brainstorm, which is step three. Brainstorming without limits. In step three, innovators need to begin exploring outside themselves. Step one and two are mostly internal processes, and with step three, you begin to reach out to others. Use all the genius that is around you to get a broader, fresher perspective that may change the way you think about the problem and, saw and, and your visual concept of the solution. There are many people around you that know a lot more than you, even though I won't always admit that. Think of the Renaissance period when experts from many fields came together to share ideas. Philosophers, painters, scientists, architects actively reached out to others for a different perspective. Modern day innovators need to network as well with others to see totally different points of view. When you brainstorm without limits, you build momentum, tremendous momentum, by inviting others to join you. There is no such thing as a bad idea. There is no such thing as a bad idea. Suspend all judgment and do not rule out anything. Keep a notebook at hand for every radical, outrageous, brilliant, and not so brilliant thought from yourself. In fact, I keep a paper and pen on my nightstand, often waking up at 3 a.m. to make a note and write down all my creative ideas. And much to my wife's chagrin, she's a very light sleeper. Remember our coloring book image? Here is where you darken your shading. Ask everyone why, why not, how, when, where, and what if. Some innovative traits, innovators' traits. Brainstorming an idea with others, building a foundation with the future stakeholders. This is important. By involving potential stakeholders early in the process, innovators plant the seed for achieving greater implementation. Remember back to our definition of innovation versus creativity? Innovation leads to implementation. Innovators need to gain insight into other cultures, walks of life, and other points of view. To the degree that an, innov an innovator includes others, they enhance the certainty of success in the innovative process. They are persistent with moving forward and are playful in questioning everything. You have to keep your energy up. Number three, application. Junkyard games participants are encouraged to support and explore all ideas while brainstorming. Nothing is too crazy for them. My colleague Bernie DeCoven is such a genius. He came up with concepts like team vo volley baseball. You can come up with systems-based quarter flipping coin toss or strategic bouncy ball beer pong. <laughs> Any, there's no limit. The teams build power as they brainstorm for each other. The energy during this step in the classroom is amazing. Participants are fully engaged 
and everyone is contributing, you can see they are passionate about innovating. And attorneys must consult with colleagues and brainstorm with experts from a variety of fields related to their case. They brainstorm with aspects of the case needed to be researched as well as their presentation. I learned a valuable lesson in exploring my innovations with others. This is a personal story. I've been working on a game board, a board game for 18 months. Unbelievable. It's called Slide Checkers. I knew I had a great game, but I couldn't get it to be as interactive and fun. It was boring the way it was currently being played. And I knew that would not fly with the licensing companies. I finally reached out to my son, who looked at it for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and simply suggested adding one additional rule, let everybody move anybody's pieces. I thought the light went on, ding, 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 ding. That was the answer. The game would have been on the shelf for another couple of years if I had not reached out in my brainstorming effort. I now have a very creative and unusual poll for you to participate in. We run this fun activity sometimes in the classes to get the juices flowing for outrageous brainstorming. In the classroom setting, you would run this as an open answer question, but here we're going to help you out in order to work with our um, system. Think about three objects, a bird, a hanger, and a large rubber band. Which of the following? best represents an innovative use of something that you might come up with in brainstorm in a brainstorming session. A basic bird cage made out of the hanger with a taut rubber band for the bird to sit on. A large slingshot made from bending the hanger into a Y and using the rubber band to shoot the bird, no pun intended. A restraint frame made out of the hanger and a rubber band to support the bird after a surgical procedure. That's for anybody in the pharmaceutical industry. Let's see what your answers are. We'll wait a minute and see what comes up. I don't. Um, I don't see any answers, but. While we're waiting, the important piece of this exercise is not any particular answer. Oh, there it is, a birdcage, 26%, a slingshot, 45%, and a restraint. We must have 27% people who work in the pharmaceutical or medical industry. <laughs> the important piece of this exercise is not really the answer you choose, but the objective here is really about observing free associating and open thinking, the foundation of all brainstorming. The goal is for participants to understand any wild and wacky thoughts should be voiced and considered. The activity uses humor to inter interject the room with positive atmosphere. It is a great way to stretch your participants' minds and innovation muscles. Now on to step four. As brainstorming spurs more visuals, it's time to start creating a prototype. In step four, you roughly design a working model. In this step, you will make your first concrete efforts to produce a visual of the ideal, a vision of the ideal. Play the mad scientist and allow yourself to experiment. It's alive. It's alive, Igor. It's wonderful. And because it's alive, it's fluid and ever-evolving process. Give yourself permission to create an imperfect prototype. Be open to and alert to any and all possibilities. Carefully observing as you build your working model. Focus on the measurements, measurable effects of the change, and think about your end user's needs. Your end user may be a customer or an employee, depending on your innovation. For implementation of your innovation to take hold, the end user must embrace it. As you begin identifying stakeholders, experts, and colleagues in step three, while brainstorming, continue to interact with them in step four. Show one of your prototypes to a few people that you trust and ask for brutally honest feedback. Reaching out to others, sharing your innovations is crucial 
and critical to maximum creativity and success. As there are several iterations at this stage, it is important to keep your earlier work, never throw anything out. As changes are made from your first model, referring back to it after attempt number 67, you will find valuable insight and a spark of the momentum. Innovators' traits in phase four. Depending on the working model, innovators are scientists at this stage. They may not be in a lab with beakers and test tubes creating explosions as they mix their concoctions, but they must take on the traits of a good scientist and apply them to step four. Playful experimentation, taking risks, allowing mistakes, recording those mistakes, and ultimately learning from them are critical to moving to step five in the innovation process. Innovators who reach step four are not afraid to take action. Next, application. Feeling secure in the brainstorming phase, innovators can sometimes delay taking action. If your participants fall into this rut, Junkyard Games quickly illustrates this. As trainers observe their teams, they can coach and encourage them immediate to action or use the insights during the debrief segment afterwards to work with participants on how to overcome them. At this point, our attorney will be writing the detailed trial briefings and rehearsing in the courtroom with, with his uh, clients in the live way. So services can be a source of uh, application to here. Our business examples, architects create scale models of their buildings. Clothing designers bring their sketches of life to life with the mannequin fitting templates. Manufacturers, managers begin to create new procedural flow charts and maps. Once your prototype is complete, you will beam with pride. But the truth is that your work has just begun. begun. The next two phases are the most important part of this process. Phase five, tinker with success. Step five, you continue to make small improvements in your product services and process. Pull out your first, fifth, and 80th prototypes if necessary and review it thoroughly. This will boost your pride and you will see where you've come from as you're inspiring new ideas. Drive forward with a fun, playful attitude. Be patient with yourself and others. This is the step where you really begin to conduct in-depth testing. Take each phase of your innovation through detailed testing to continually make incremental improvements. Don't be afraid to completely change everything. As you continue to involve stakeholders and experts, strive for as much feedback as possible. This phase allows you to let go of your innovation so that you can embrace a broader range of input and creativity. It is very hard to let go, but very valuable. This will ensure sustainability in the long run. Next, innovator traits. At this step, innovators must challenge the status quo. They, might, they may receive pressure from others stating that things are fine the way they are. They need to be persistent in striving for perfection. Objectivity is important here so that they really look at the integrity of their own work. Patience with repeated attempts and willingness to adapt their plans and start over is critical. The innovator never gives up with tinkering with their ideas. Step five, application. When permitted by the facilitator in the junkyard games, teams are encouraged to visit other tables to look at how their competitors' innovation efforts are coming along. Since each team must create a unique game, there are many ideas in the room to spark additional insights. As teams discuss their own efforts with other teams, they learn to use and integrate new innovative expertise and ideas. They are given more time to continue to tinker with their game designs for functionality and durability. Similar to the classroom, attorneys must work together in their offices, including paralegals, to do the proper research, to continue revisiting and revising their defense plan to streamline effectiveness. Product manufacturers find amazing success when tinkering with current product lines you will frequently see products marketed as new and improved. Procter & Gamble is a great example. 
they continually upgrade products based on the market research and product development. Innovations in the brand such as CoverGirl, Clairol, Ivory Soap, there's always a new and improved innovation. Great progress is being made with your innovation by step five. You have started with the end in mind, brainstormed all the possible solutions to form visual concepts. That concept is now made into a rough model that you are fully tested, blown up, and refined. Step six solidifies all your previous work and really prepares you for successful implementation. Step six, redesign and remodel. In step six, you repeat many of the steps in four and five, so you have created a working model and tinker with it continually. There is still more to do. There is sometimes, this is sometimes called rinse and repeat. This step ensures that every rock has been uncovered and every bug has been worked out. Stakeholders are not just included in the innovative process, but they are excited and committed to the final outcome. In this step, you will be spiraling upward. You will have more experience, knowledge, wisdom, and insight that will really boost your innovative skill. You will learn from all your past successes and failures. You are a completely different level than when you first began. You are now striving for perfection. Innovator's traits. As the innovator reaches the second to last stage, the innovator process, they are personally come a long way in the journey. They have shown creativity, motivation, childlike questioning, a scientific-like analysis, positive thinking, all at its best. Innovators have shown persistence, lots of persistence. They have nurtured, fleshed out, breathed life into the spark of an idea from early on. Application. As junkyard games, teams are continually working with their designs to get them exactly right. Time pressure adds excitement to this stage. They will be playing their innovative games very quickly. And time pressure is always an issue. Teams must be persistent in testing and reviewing their brainstorming ideas noted in the journal so that they're always spiraling upward with their wisdom and insights. The important piece here is to learn from your mistakes and previous iterations. I'll repeat that. Learn from your mistakes. Valuable, valuable uh, suggestion. Gameplay must be worked and reworked so that the flow is just perfect. Not too easy, not too hard, not too fast, not too slow. The room at this stage is extremely alive and lively. Although most of the games are intact and nearly ready to go, there is junk all over the table and everyone's standing up as they are actively working on their final refinements of the sporting games. The energy in the room is filled with excitement and anticipation for the final competition. Sometimes the attorneys that we've talked about need to revise their case based on new unexpected witnesses or evidence submitted. They must thoroughly review their plans to ensure that when they get into court, that they are ready to go. Persistence to hit the mark in step six is very important. Let me tell you a story, a wonderful story. Dan Amos, president of Aflac uh, Insurance, led a great company that a few people, only a few people knew about. Marketing staff and consultants pulled together volumes of research, demographic data, to pitch their ad campaign, but it was never hitting the mark. Dan Amos did not like it. Advertising agency Kaplan Thayer Group understood Amos' desire and talked to him a great deal. He wanted brand recognition. As they were playing with ideas, one of the directors had a hard time remembering the company name and kept repeating it over and over again, realizing that it sounded much like a quacking duck. <laughs> A, few, a new campaign was born. Amos got to choose between the duck and many more conservative campaigns. Amos took a risk, and it was the most successful ad campaign of all time. As her, his persistency to find the right solution paid off, and now everyone has heard the famous name, Aflac, Aflac. <laughs> so it's now time to go let go of our baby, release it into the unknown, and move into step seven. Our final stage is that in the innovation process. 
implementation. Congratulations, you've done it. You are implementing your innovation. In this stay, step, you will reveal your innovation to a larger scale than just stakeholders that you have been working with from the beginning. Provide uh, completed trials to end users, continually beta testing, but still allowing for innovation to be launched. Communication to the right network about your innovation provides cultural integration. Include the appropriate departments and outside agencies to get your innovation onto the streets. <clears throat> Marketing and sales are involved here with high energy, along with distribution and training. The innovator becomes an entrepreneur and master of change in this final step. Achieve acceptance of your innovation, innovation, but remember everything can always be better. Start small while thinking big. Limit your initial production or rollout so that you have room to tweak as end users provide invaluable feedback. <clears throat> Application. Let the junkyard games competition begin. Team play, teams play all of the other team's games and are scored based on competitive performance scoring charts provided. Medals are given out to the top three competitors and each of the first, second, and third prizes. Teams are judged on innovation and creativity for their sport as well as the results of their gameplay. And after the games, the trainer brings the entire class to debrief the activity. Participants are given the opportunity to note down their insights and create their own action plan for how they will increase their innovative talents in the job. And with so many inner innovative successes experienced in the classroom after only two to three hours, participants become inspired and motivated to apply the seven-step innovative model back at the workplace and through their organizations. As a classroom trainer myself, I witnessed many incredible aha moments during this training phase. Let me share a personal experience when I launched my first patented game that I ever produced called Give and Take. I was so excited and probably a little cocky that I thought I have reached perfection. Manufacturing was completed with 5,000 copies which gave me a great price per piece but was still a huge investment at that time. Some last minute testing uncovered vital new market research that had to be incorporated. So I wound up driving 10 hours to Michigan and working two days to replace 5,000 key parts before wide-scale distribution could be done. When launching this an innovation, limit your size of your first run and end user rollout so that you still have room to tinker. Anyone really can learn how to innovate. So. To close, let's review our journey through innovation, taking uh, towards implementation and the amazing ideas that we've come up with. Start with the end in mind. Visualize success and conceptualize every aspect of the task necessary to reach it. Brainstorm without limits. Design and produce a rough working model. Tinker with it continually. Redesign and remodel until you hit the mark. Strive for full implementation, distribution, and cultural integration of your innovation. And so my challenge to you is question everything, embrace the spark of your idea, never give up until you see the, your genius innovation come to life. Thomas Edison said it best, I have never failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. I believe we have a few minutes for questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. We do have a couple minutes here for some questions. Um, you can also key them in um, in the top right-hand corner. You can send in your questions now, and I'll review those as Ron um, gives us some answers, and we can ask those as well. Um, our first question is, is really about the game. Um, they wanted some more feel for what were some of the some of the games that the teams do design. So with those parts and pieces, could you describe some of those um, um, some of the games. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, we often give them uh, tables to work at that are um, 30 inches by 72 inches. So there's games sliding and hockey and 
catapults and shooting pieces up in the air. Um, when some people have actually allowed, it depends on the rules of the game, but if you allow them to use other pieces within the room, we've had people shoot different items into plants and use erasers on boards. So the sky's the limit. Great. And, and out of those game pieces, um, what's included in those? I know you mentioned the bouncy balls and the um, rubber bands. What else is in that pack? Well, each packet has um, probably, within Junkyard Games, comes with three sets of identical pieces to start with. And it has all kinds of projectiles, um, pieces that um, for receiving, sending, shooting, moving, uh, bouncy balls. I mean, there's, there's literally hundreds of pieces, pieces we're using uh, as little bats and little um, slides. I'm not quite sure what to say. I don't have the list in front of me. I apologize. <laughs> no, and, and that, does, um, that does answer it, I believe. We have um, another question that has come in specifically about the workshop. Roughly, how, how long does the training workshop take? Well, yeah, you can, normally it's about two to three hours. Um, to try and run it, you can run it more quickly, but to get the real learning out of it and the meat of it, it would say two to three hours. And you have to get them to prepare, make sure they document all their progress, all their performance. And uh, then at the end, make sure you review carefully. Another really important part is doing the actual making of the games. These seven steps really apply. Frequently in the first iteration of the game, it is really not very good. You have to, as a facilitator, constantly get them to think at a higher level and, and, and use more uh, creativity and innovation in their game. And to continue, and I, I, it's funny, I, there's a lot of the, the stuff of what people use in the game seems to be very um, exciting to our audience on the line today. We have another question. Um, to, if you've ever played it where you've actually had an undisclosed box of, of different random stuff that's in there to see if the participants will actually go combing around the room looking for things um, that they then could incorporate into that. Do you ever incorporate that into the yeah. training session? Well, yeah, you can do anything you want. We start out with three equal pieces, uh, sets, but after the second game, after the first game, you can leave them all uneven and tell them nobody has all the same pieces. If you want, you'll have to see negotiate for pieces if you want. And if everybody agrees on it, you can say you can have anything in the room, use anything in the room, or you can restrict it to just the pieces that come with it. But we've included seven or eight key pieces that are necessary, including uh, things like projectile receptacles, uh, methods of moving materials. There's seven or eight key pieces in each of the packets. And yes, you could um, add to it. Great. And our last question for today, what changes in behaviors or results have you seen after playing junkyard games? Yeah. Well, I've done it with a couple companies. One pharmaceutical company comes to mind. We were trying to innovate for future development, sustainability uh, of buildings and manufacturing processes. And I think they had a lot of awakening as to what worked and what didn't work. One of them tried to use, uh, I'll be specific, use cows to create a methane manufacturing plant. And <laughs> nobody thought that the plant might blow up. <laughs> so, so the point is that there's a lot of change that occurs. People become more sensitized to all the implications that are involved in implementation. That's why steps five and six are so important before you implement. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Ron. Okay. If you, My pleasure. If we, if we did not get to answer your question, you will receive an emailed response directly. Feel free to contact us with any additional questions or feedback on today's webcast. As an exclusive offer for attending today, um, you will receive 20% off any junkyard game at our website, hrdq.com. Use the coupon code JGWebcast, all lowercase, with no spaces. We do appreciate your time and hope you found today's webcast informative.